in Los Angeles at the Roxy. It became that. It became that people would come back and back again. It's like uh, you take somebody like Carol King, who was on Ode Records, which Lou Adler was one of the producers of Rocky Horror. Well, Carol King came several times, and, and at the end she started to dress like Magenta. I think that was, and and Keith Moon from the Who, the, the drummer who died from the Who, uh, would come, and he got into this thing of there would be if Keith Moon was in the house that particular night. There was nine people in the cast on stage. There would be nine bottles of champagne lined up across the front of the stage. And you go, oh, Keith Moon's here. And and Elvis Presley came. And uh, I had the most horrible experience once. Uh, Raquel Welch came. And I'm standing in the hallway with no clothes on. And Raquel Welch is coming down the the, the, the hallway. And I was so I, I was so embarrassed that I didn't know what to do. And I, I looked up at her and I said, "Oh, it's Anne Margaret," and which she was not a bit happy about. I can tell you that. And I, I wrote her a, a letter of apology, and I just explained to her that if if you see Raquel Welch coming down the hallway and you're standing with no clothes on, you tend to like say things and go you know get delusional at that point. And <clears throat> so. There was, you know, a lot of things happened, and you met a lot of people. And, and I remember the, um, my best story of, of, of that from Rocky Horror is uh, the movie. And I was really excited because at that point I thought I was going to do Eddie and Dr. Scott, the same as in the, uh, in the play. And then I was still excited. They said, well, we're, we're going to have somebody else do Dr. Scott. And I said, you're making a huge mistake. <laughs> and I and – I, and I, and I still think they did. Even though the actor was fine, I think they made a huge mistake because the, the way it was in the play, Eddie and Dr. Scott really looked alike. And so you knew it was his nephew and they, you know, and, and, and um, I was a very good Dr. Scott. And so the first two weeks when we were doing the play, all we did was the music. We just rehearsed the music. They had not given us a script. And back then, when you got hired to do something, you know, you were making $185, $287 a week. And so it's not like you were getting rich as an actor in New York. You were working and you were paying your rent. But you, at that point in my career, I really didn't say, well, what's the play about? Somebody said, we'll pay you $287. So I'm there, babe. And um, so we're learning the music. And I'm going, well, this music's interesting. And they come to me on the part of uh, Hot Patootie. And Richard O'Brien is here at these rehearsals. And he said to me, uh, I remember this, he says, uh, listen, on this song, because we'd just gotten to that song, he said, on this song, don't, you know, you'll never be able to get all the words in. No, nobody, you know, in, in England, two or three people have tried and they can't uh, sing all the words. And he, and he said, I wrote it and I can't sing all the words. And I looked at him, I said, I can sing all the words. And he said, no, there, there, it, it, there's too many to go into the fray. I said, I can sing all the words, and I did, and he, and he was blown away from the fact that I was able to do like, a, oh, how does it go, whatever happened to Saturday night, when you dressed up sharp and you felt all right, don't seem the same since cosmic light came into my life, I thought I was divine, I used to go for a ride with a chick could go, and listen to the radio music on, whatever it was, but he could nobody could ever get in and just make those words fly through it, so... So I was able to do that, which was really exciting. And, uh, and I just love telling people, I can do that, and then being able to do it. So anyway, uh, this is a long story. So anyway, so we've been in rehearsal maybe, maybe two weeks, maybe a little less, when they, they tell us that this week Tim Curry's coming, and then the day he's coming in. And so we're all, we, we know he's coming. I think it's on a Wednesday. For some reason, Wednesday comes into my mind at the moment. And we're in this little theater down in Hollywood, a little bitty tiny theater, and rehearsing. And they've actually started to put the beginning of the play on its feet at this point. We still really not, don't have a script other than just like lines for pieces. And, uh, and so we t they said, well, Tim Curry's supposed to come in today. He's supposed to come in today. So we're running the music in order now of how it goes. But we haven't ever heard any of Tim's songs. We've only heard... The songs we're singing, or 
And they haven't really presented us with any of these like weird songs yet. And we get to this point in the play where Tim comes in with Sweet Transvestite. And the back doors of this theater open and he comes marching down the aisle in a leather jacket with fishnet stockings and these platform shoes on. And I look at this guy coming down this aisle and he's singing, I'm a sweet transvestite. And I, I, and I literally get up and walk out of the theater. And I turn to Graham Jarvis going, I'm gone. I'm not doing this. I'm out of here. And he follows me out and he's going, and he's trying to say to me, me you got to go back. I said, I'm not going back. I said, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing a play where some guy's wearing fishnet stockings. What kind of play is this? And I'm very naive anyway. I don't get sex jokes half the time. So I, I, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I, we get, and I actually get a ticket for jaywalking. I cross Hollywood Boulevard on a red light, and the cop pulls me over and gives me a ticket for a motorcycle cop. And Graham goes, you got to go back. you got to go back. Now then, the stage manager and Brian Avnet and some other people have come out on the street looking for me, and I'm going, I can't do this. I'm not doing it. They said, look. Just come back. We'll understand. Once you see the whole thing, we'll understand if you, if you really can't do it. And I said, no, I can't do this. And then, then I sort of said, well, it is a comedy. It is a musical. I understand it's a parody. Now they've given us a script. I'm able to read it. I'm able to see what it is. Okay, and they've explained to me what I'm doing and how Dr. Scott works and this whole thing. And then I read in the script where Dr. Scott is supposed to wear high heels and fishnet stockings. And I go up to him, I said, uh, uh, look, uh, I'll stay and do the play because I, I think it's funny. But I said, I, I'm drawing the line here. I said, I, I, um, they go, well, it's a really a big part of the play. I said, well, I guess you'll ha I, I can't do it. And they go, well, just, just bear with They keep saying, just bear with me. Try it, you know. And I'm going, I'm not doing it. So the next thing, you know, I'm being fitted for high heels, <laughs> high heels shoes. And now they've given me this garter belt. Right? And he said, well, just for the dress rehearsal, just try them on. No, I'm not trying them on. They go, just try them on. I'm, and so I've gone this far, so I go, okay, I'll try them on. So at the first preview of this show, I'm like freaking out because I've got these plain Dr. Scott and I've got this blanket on my lap and I've got these fishnet stockings and these high heel and this garter belt and this black underwear on. And you got to remember that I, that I weighed a probably about 60 pounds more than I do now. And so I go out, and part of the thing is this blanket falls off my lap, and I bring my leg up like this with this fishnet stocking, this high heel, and the audience, it, they, they, it is, I've never heard such laughter in my entire life. And if you know me and you know my personality, I will always go for the laugh. That's the first thing I'm going for is the laugh, no matter what it is. And when that happened, everybody on stage started. And Tim Curry is the most professional actor that you can would never break character, would never laugh, would never break his, his thing. He started to laugh. Everybody on stage started to laugh. The audience just kept going and kept going, and the laughter would not stop. And I've got my leg up in this shoe, and I'm milking it now. Now I'm really going for it. I'm waving my foot around, and I'm doing and, and from this moment on, I have never in my entire life, and I've seen a lot of comedy, seen an audience laugh that hard. I mean, people were crying. and You know how you, you, people are in pain from it. And, and so... And that happened on several occasions, mostly on Saturday nights, like the second show on a Saturday night when people had a, a bit to drink, would they go complete? And you'd see Tim, not, not all the time, but ever so often, the laughter would just go on so long that Tim would just start to laugh, and everybody would just start to laugh. And, I, and Timmy would ad-lib some stuff at that point, and I can't remember. I'm sorry I don't remember his ad-libs, because they were funny as well. But that's a great moment, so that's the answer to that question. You would... <laughs> Tim was in town doing something, and I met up over at his hotel, and we all wanted to go down to check this out, what we'd been hearing. So we went down there, and it was sold out. And so somebody there, the ticket lady or whatever, said, are, are, are you, t are 
like, you were in the movie? Because Tim didn't look like that now. Tim's hair was short. And, and of course, I didn't look like Eddie at all. I had long hair. And, and, and I go, yeah, this is Tim Curry and I'm Meatloaf. He, he plays Frankenfurter. She goes, I thought so. And I'm going, shh, be quiet. And so I said, look, we brought these people. We just want to try to get in. And she goes, oh, okay, okay, I'll get you in. I'll get you in. And the owner of the Waverly or the manager comes out and goes, what are you doing? And she goes, well, they're in the movie and it's sold out and they want to get in. And she goes, well, they can't come in. I'm going, but this is Tim Curry. This is the star. And, and, sh and she says, she looks at him and she goes, and this girl goes, it's true, it's the star. And the woman goes, okay, I'll let you in, but I'm going to be watching and you better be who you say you are. And the woman stood there for the longest until Eddie came up and just stared at us. And it was like really hard to watch the movie because there's this woman going, are you who you are? First of all, they had a real motorcycle, which I, I, I rode little pieces of it, but they had a stuntman. And the stuntman was on the motorcycle that b b burst through the, it was part ice and part wax, those the ice blocks. He came through, and then after he went through the wall, they put me back in the freezer, and I came through the hole he had made. So it cut, you know, to Little Nell and back to me coming through. Well, it was tough to ride on the wax, and I kept losing the back wheel, but I managed it okay. And so after that, they're saying, do you think this bike is too much for you to handle? I said, what we, what we need you to do is we want you to, <laughs> this is crazy, we want you to ride up the ramp and around the thing and come down the ramp and circle it. And I looked at him, I said, what? Do you want me to ride? I said, no, I can't do that. So the stuntman said, well, we can do that. And so they're trying to figure out, Okay, we can shoot it so that the stunt man can do it. Now we got, but we got to get a close up of me up on that ramp. And so they tried getting me up on the bike, just standing there. But they go, well, it's not moving. We need movement. We need movement. So then they tried tried me sitting on the bike, just kind of coasting down the ramp. But I didn't have control of it, and the camera couldn't. So, so finally, I don't know who it was devised this. They took the windshield and the handlebars off the motorcycle and some of the you know, speedometer and things like that. And they put them on the front of a wheelchair. And so I'm sitting in this wheelchair with this handlebars and these things and this, this windshield. And so now they're going, and they've got me with a rope onto the back of this wheelchair. <clears throat> and so they're testing it. Can I... Can I run? Can I run? The, can I guide this wheelchair down the ramp at some kind of speed that looks like we're actually moving? And we rehearsed it, and rehearsed it, and rehearsed it, and it was great. And so then we started shooting. And they go, "Oh, I can't. It's not working. It's not working." So they decided, "Well, let's mount a camera onto the front of this wheelchair." So now I've got a camera on the front of the wheelchair. I got handlebars on a wheelchair. I got these things on. I got this windshield. So they go, they say, action, speed, you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Well, what they didn't realize, now the camera had made this front heavy. So when I reach the bottom of the, of the ramp, it doesn't just smooth on out. There's a little ridge. And that wheelchair hits that ridge, and it flips this wheelchair. And my stand-in saw me going. He goes to get me, catches his leg in a and part of the ramp snaps his leg. He breaks his leg. He, didn't, he breaks his leg. I'm now, the camera, I'm falling on the camera. The camera is shattered into pieces. The handlebars are, have cut my arm like this. I've got, I got a cut on my head. I'm, I'm in, there's wheelchair and, and it's like everywhere. There's people in pain and camera pieces and everything and everybody's running around and everybody's trying to help me. And here's this poor stand-in. I think the bone had come through his leg. I can't remember. But he's over here going, oh, God, ah. And they're all kind of, they come over to me. I'm going, I'm okay, but check him out. You know, and it's like, and so then, oh, my God. And then they left me alone, and I'm bleeding now. And so I'm going, wait, come and give me somebody. But then, wait, we're not through with this. I know, I got to go fast. He told me to go fast. We're running out of tape. We're okay. Okay. I'm almost out of tape. We'll I know. But, I don't have any more tape. Okay. So you would think that that story of the wheelchair and the camera and the break in the leg, that would end it. But no. So now then, it comes the day of the stuntman.
going to ride the ramp. And you see it in the film. So if you watch the film, he comes up the ramp where the people have been standing, and it's uh, above the freezer. And what they've done now is they've gotten me on the motorcycle. And they run, I run the motorcycle up to the ramp, and like I'm going to start it up the ramp. And then they catch it, and we stop. And now the stuntman, and then they go the other side, and I just roll the motorcycle down the ramp on the other end to catch that piece. Now the, motor, the, now the stuntman is going to run this motorcycle at a pretty good clip around a circle going around this ramp. On his first run up the ramp, he makes it once. He comes back around. On the second one, he gets too close to the edge up at the top above the freezer, and the motorcycle falls off the wall. And it gets upside down, and it's an old 1941 military, and it weighs a ton. And it literally, upside down, it, he comes straight to the ground with that on top of him, just like he was still riding it. It just falls like that. Now then, <clears throat> I could never do this in a million years, but you've heard the stories of the adrenaline people get, give them extra strength. I literally by myself ran over there and picked this motorcycle up and moved it, didn't move very far, just moved it off of him, that far. Like, just picked it up and put it down, not even thinking what I was doing. And I'm standing there watching this guy, and, he, and everybody's now around, and everybody's going, move back, move back. And, and, and he's not moving. He's not doing anything. And the room is falling silent. And we're watching this guy, and all of a sudden, you see his... I don't remember his foot or his hand moved, but it was like he moved, it came right up. And then the minute he opened his eyes, he looked around and he goes, okay, let's do it again. And, and everybody went, whoa, whoa, stop, stop. Are you okay? He goes, yeah, I'm okay. And they said, well, what were you doing? And he said, well, he said, whenever you have an accident like that, the first thing you do is you don't move anything. He said, I don't move anything. And he said, I slowly run up my body to check to see if, there's any pain anywhere. He goes, I go from my feet to my legs to my knees to my thing. And he says, I go all the way up my back, my arms. And he said, I don't move anything until I've checked out every inch, gone through it. Because he said, when that happens, you're, this is like a whole conversation we had later. Uh, you know, you kind of, your body goes into a state of shock, so you don't necessarily feel pain immediately. And he said, so you have to really stop and check it out. And then I went over to try to move the body. I couldn't budget. Couldn't, I mean, I could like, yup, and, and everybody, then that was the kind of the conversation. How do you do that? I have no idea. But then he finished it and everything was fine. But that's the true stories of Eddie. For anybody who ever wanted to know what happened to Eddie's jacket, I have it. And I've had it since 1974. Sue Blaine did a great job. Look at this. It's perfect for Eddie. But there's little skeleton keychain pieces. And, and we lost a couple when we were doing the thing, and, and, and the star broke when we were, um, this is all mishaps from the set. Like, I lost a star probably in that fall with the wheelchair. A little piece broke off, and at some point, obviously, the chain broke. And so what they did was they used a safety pin just to put it back together. So there you go. It's how it was when I finished shooting, and it's still here, and it's mine, and I have it. Ha, 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 ha.